Well, come and let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise unto him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God, a great King above all gods. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who has made the heaven and the earth. Grace be unto you in peace from God the Father through our Lord Jesus Christ in communion with the Holy Ghost. Amen. Continue our worship this morning with the singing of Psalm 124 that you'll find on page 266 of your hymn book, 266. Let us now hear the word of God's holy law as we find it in Exodus chapter 20. And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children under the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. 
Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass nor anything that is thy neighbor's. In response to the reading of God's law, we'll sing from Psalm 19 in your hymn book number 29.
We believe in the forgiveness of sins. We confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us pray. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. Lord, that is a truth, that is a fact, It is our prayer, Lord, that thy glory might be manifest in such a way that all the world would so see and recognize thy glory. We pray, O Father, that thy name indeed would be hallowed, would be sanctified, would be set apart in such a way that all glory and all honor would be unto that holy and that righteous name. Lord, may we witness, even in our day, that time when the earth will be filled with the glory of God and the knowledge of God, even as the waters fill the sea. Lord, we come and we pray, therefore, that thy will might be done. We pray that thy kingdom indeed would come. We come on this Sabbath day with hearts that are filled with praise and worship unto thy holy name. We believe in God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. That triune God, we worship all. We worship each one. And we pray, therefore, O Lord, that as we come into thy holy presence, recognizing that we come in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, We come recognizing that he is the only mediator between God and men. It is only because of his sacrifice, the blood that he has shed, that has opened up this way of access, where we have this entrance into the holy throne, room of heaven. So it is in Jesus' name that we offer our worship and make our prayers and our supplications before thy throne of grace. We would ask, O Lord, that thou would hear us, for thou art a God that loves to hear and to answer prayer. Lord, our hearts are heavy as we come into the beginning of this new year, heavy as we look at all of the evil that is around us, heavy, Lord, as we look at all of the hatred against thee that is so evident on every hand. It appears that the kingdoms of this world are prevailing against the kingdom of thy son. But Lord, it cannot be. We believe that our God is upon his throne and regardless of what we see at any particular time in any particular moment or circumstance, that thou art ruling according to thy eternal purpose and that thy will will be done here on earth even as it is in heaven. But Lord, we pray that in this day of hostility, in this day of hatred and animosity against Christ, against the church, that the Lord would show himself to be strong, that we would see the faithfulness of God and the power of God that is evident right across this world. Lord, there are political problems and there are social problems and there are economic problems and there are religious problems and crises all around us. But Lord, we pray that in the midst of it all, that the Lord Jesus would be lifted up and that the word that he gave concerning his church would be evidently fulfilled, that the church of Christ will go forward. It will advance, and not even the gates of hell can prevail against it. And Lord, we who are in this place today as believers, who know the Lord Jesus, know what it is to have been rescued from the very gates of hell. We are but brands that have been plucked from the burning. So, Lord, thou hast done it for us, and we believe that thou canst do it again and do it continually and in remarkable ways right across this world. So we do pray at the beginning on this first Sabbath day of this year that the Christ's kingdom, the church of the Lord Jesus, would advance right across this world. We pray for those of our persecuted brethren that are in places, Lord, suffering in ways that we cannot imagine. We commit them into thy hands, into thy care. And we pray, O Lord, that 
their testimony would shine so remarkably bright uh, in the places in which thou hast placed them. So, Lord, hear our prayers in their behalf. We do pray, Lord, for the part of the vineyard in which we labor. We pray, O God, that in each of our spheres of service, each of our spheres of ministry, that we would know the help and the power of the Spirit of God, that we would see in Grand Rapids the advancing of the church, we would see in Grand Rapids the advancing of the cause of Christ. Lord, bless this church. We pray, Lord, that uh, as they seek to labor in their little part of the vineyard, that they would know the hand of God upon them, that you'd bless the minister and bless the uh, elders. Lord, we pray for le the leadership of this congregation. We pray for every member. Uh, we pray for the blessing of God in this next year to fall abundantly upon this congregation. Lord, use them well. We do pray for every need that would be represented here, Lord. Thou dost know what they are. Those that may be infirm, those that are housebound even now, Lord, we commit them into thy hands for thy care. Thou art the great physician. Thou art the one who knows all the needs and the cares of the people of God. For we have a great high priest that has been touched with all the feeling of our infirmities. He knows and he cares, and we can therefore cast our cares and cast our burdens and all of our concerns upon the Lord, knowing not only that he cares, but that he has the power to alleviate our needs and to meet us exactly at the point of our needs. So Lord, hear us. We pray that even now that thou wouldst look to that man that is seated at thy right hand, that bears the scars of his sacrifice, those glorified scars, that bears the names of his people upon his shoulders and over his breast, and for his sake, that thou would hear us and answer our prayers. And Lord, it is our desire as we come into this sanctuary today that we might be sensitive to the presence of the Lord with us. We are gathered here in Jesus' name. We are conscious, therefore, that Christ has promised that when we gather together in his name, even but if two or three, that he is there in the midst. So we pray, Lord, that as we worship today, that we would do so with that consciousness, with that awareness that we are in the midst of the Savior and he is in our midst. We pray, O oh God, that our worship, therefore, would be genuine, would be sincere, that the meditations of our heart and the expressions of our uh, praise and thanksgiving would be acceptable before thee, O God, who is our rock, who is our redeemer. We do pray, Lord, for the administration of thy word today. We pray that as the word of God is read in a few moments and expounded, that the spirit of God might be in attendance with every word that is uttered, that the Lord might speak to us, we would ask, O oh Lord, for that divine visitation. We would ask, O oh Lord, for the divine word to go forth in this place, having free course, that it would be glorified. Take away every obstacle, every hindrance to its entrance into our hearts, into our lives. Lord, speak to us. Give us the swiftness to hear. And in the swiftness to hear, we would pray that we would also be doers of thy word. But speak to us, preserve us from the thoughts of man, the notions of man. But may we be aware today that we are hearing the very word of the living God. Speak to us to that end. So Lord, we commit now this service into thy hands. We pray for thy blessing to be here. We pray for thy power to be evident, for thy presence to be real. Lord, glorify thy name. Use us to that end. Be pleased with our worship as we pray in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Receiving now the tithes and the offerings.
for the preaching of God's word, we will stand and sing together in your hymn book 212 from Psalm 107. Returning to the Old Testament scriptures, to the book of Exodus chapter 12, Exodus chapter 12, let us hear the word of the Lord. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months, it shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak ye unto the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb according 
to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it out of the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it up until the fourteenth day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And you shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door post of the houses wherein they shall eat it. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread. And with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Eat not of it raw, nor sodden at all with water, but roast with fire, his head with his legs, with the pertinence thereof. And he shall let nothing of it remain until the morning, and that which remaineth of it until the morning ye shall burn with fire. And thus shall ye eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff on your hand, and ye shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and will smite the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. And this day shall be unto you for a memorial. And ye shall keep it a feast of the Lord throughout your generations. Ye shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. Ending our reading at verse number 14. First Sabbath of every new year is always special. It's always a time when, as a minister, we would seek to have a word that is most appropriate, a word that would be relevant to the needs of the day and our expectations for the year that is to come. And thinking of that for this Sabbath morning, I thought of this text at the beginning of Exodus chapter 12, where the Lord, in describing the events of the Passover, says that this month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. And we have what follows God's own New Year's message for the people. And if God thought in his divine wisdom that this message was relevant for the beginning of the new year then, I submit that it's relevant for the beginning of our new year as well. It would be hard to find a major topic of theology that does not find its expression some way and somewhere in the book of Exodus. In fact, many of the themes of redemption that God progressively reveals through the entire scripture have their origin in this book of Exodus. And unquestionably, the greatest single event of Old Testament history was the exodus from Egypt. That was a supreme demonstration of God's grace, of God's faithfulness, and of God's power. And that exodus event, that deliverance of Israel from the land of bondage from Egypt became a pattern, became a paradigm of God's saving acts and God's saving purpose for his people. Every other deliverance in the scripture, in one way or another, finds its definition, its pattern here in Exodus. And if this event was precious to the Old Testament Jew, I would suggest that it is doubly precious for the Christian. For the allusions to this event are thick and fast in the New Testament scripture. The New Testament has some 31 references to the Passover event, and almost all of them are in the context of the passion, the sufferings of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that should 
immediately answer any question of doubt that the ultimate message of the Passover goes far beyond any sacrifice of a lamb or a goat to that once and for all sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ in behalf of his people. The Apostle Paul said that Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. So there are lessons in this Passover for sinners that are still in their sins. And there are lessons in the Passover for believers that must remember the bondage from which the Lord has so graciously and wonderfully taken them from. And so on this Sabbath day, in the time that we have together around the word, I want us to look at God's message, God's New Year's message to these people. Things that they were to remember from that day forward, no matter what the year would bring. And who knows? Who knows? I have no idea and you have no idea what the next little time is going to bring before us. But there are some truths here that regardless of the events and the circumstances and the transpiring of events that will take place in this old world, there are things here that must be preeminent preeminent and predominant in our thinking as we face the time before us. There are three principal lessons, maybe four, but three principal lessons that I want us to see, things that God wanted these people to remember, And things, therefore, that God wants us to remember as we come to the beginning of months. And I say, first of all, very simply, that we are to remember that salvation is by grace. Salvation is by grace, and those that are saved are saved purely by grace. You can't be mistaken as you read through this particular chapter in Exodus. That in Egypt that night, there were going to be some that died, and there were going to be some that lived. The Lord was going to put a difference between some that he had sentenced to death and others that he had ordained to life. Some were going to live, and some were going to die. And that raises the question, why? Why is it? Why is it that some in Egypt that night would be under this terrible sentence of death? And why is it some in Egypt that night would be the recipients of this magnificent display of God's deliverance and God's salvation? There was a difference. I cannot come to the text and say that Israel was worthy of deliverance. The Bible makes it clear that Israel in the land of Egypt was guilty of the same idolatry. They were guilty of the same transgressions that the Egyptians were guilty of. They were pagans. I think we get the impression sometimes that Egypt or the Israelites were there in Egypt somehow as persecuted saints, persecuted believers. But that was not the case. You read Joshua, you read Ezekiel, make references to the religious status of Israel As they were in Egypt, they became tainted with all the paganism, all the idolatry, all the superstition. They were as as big a sinners as the Egyptians. So why were they delivered? Why were they delivered? And why were the Egyptians sentenced to death? Oh, Israel was not delivered, I say, because they were suffering affliction. They deserved everything they were getting and more. They were not delivered because there was some potential within them of worth that would make them special if they could just get out of this bondage. Not at all. The only reason, the only reason that God set his love upon this people, as Moses explained to this generation when they came to the end of the wilderness, to the next generation, as Moses reviewed this whole history of God's dealing with the people, why is it? Why is it that God loved you? Not because you're righteous, because you're not righteous. Not because you're big in number, because you're just a puny little people. But you have that amazing statement in Deuteronomy chapter 7 where the Lord says, I loved you because I loved you. 
The reason God loved them was not found within them. There was nothing lovely about them, nothing righteous about them. The reason God set his love upon that people was because of God's sovereign, God's willful pleasure, God's grace, God's grace. Pure and simple. Pure and simple. We need to take every reminder of God's grace, and that question can come to us. That question can come to us today as well. I don't know your hearts. If you're a believer, if you're a believer today, if you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, why will you live? Why is it that you've come to faith? Why is it that you saw something in the Lord Jesus that the wicked and the pagan don't see? Why? Something special about you? Some special insight that you have that others don't have? No. We're all dead in our trespasses and sins. All born alienated from God, haters of God, hostile to everything that is good and righteous. But there's grace. There is grace. How amazing. How amazing, how wonderful is the grace of God. And it's not without significance that then at the beginning of this new year, at the beginning of what was to be a new year for these people, the Lord says, remember grace. Remember grace that no matter what else happens, no matter what circumstances you face, there is the grace of God. There is the grace of God that is the very foundation, the very reason that we believe. We believe by grace. The Passover became a celebration of that grace. And every year, every year at the beginning of the year, they celebrated this Passover feast. A reminder that they are what they are, not because they deserved it, not because they earned it, not because they were a special people in and of themselves. But every year became a reminder to them of the wonder, the wonder of God's saving grace. But we are to remember as well. We are to remember as well that we're saved because of Christ. And the Passover gives to us a most graphic lesson in what a substitutionary atonement is. We have here a picture prophecy. The Lord is instructing the people and instructing us in the word to look at the picture. To look at the picture and then to see what this picture points to. And it points to the Lord Jesus because Paul, remember, said it's Christ who is our Passover that has been sacrificed for us. But as we look at these Old Testament pictures, all of the animal sacrifices in the Old Testament here, and then once we enter into the tabernacle, the temple, all the Levitical and ceremonial laws, all of those sacrifices, all those animal sacrifices were just picture prophecies. They were picture prophecies of Christ who was the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. Imperfect pictures. But they were vivid pictures. And so as we look at the Passover lamb, it is for us to look beyond that Passover lamb to the reality. The reality. The shadow. These were shadows. These were shadows. I I, I like the way Hebrews describes these Old Testament ceremonies, these Old Testament sacrifices. They were shadows of the things that were to come. You know what a shadow is. A shadow is not the reality of something. I I see my shadow. I see my shadow, and the shadow draws my attention to it, and I can see even now as I'm making this gesture, there are my shadows there on the platform. I see my hand, but that that shadow is not the reality. This is my hand. My hand is what's casting the shadow. I'm the reality. The shadow is just a representation, and it's imperfect. It's imperfect. I know what it represents. I can tell it's me. I can tell it's me, but it's not me. And so as we look at these Old Testament sacrifices, they are shadows. And whenever we see a shadow, right, we want to look to see what is casting that shadow. 
and the reality that is casting the shadow on all of these Old Testament sacrifices, the reality that is casting the shadow in these Passover celebrations is the Lord Jesus. So we look at the shadow, and we can learn lessons from the shadow. But let us never so fix our attention on the shadow that we fail to look to the reality that casts the shadow, and that's what I want us to do here for a few moments. The Lamb tells us certain things here. And grace, certainly, grace notwithstanding its sovereignty, cannot be exercised apart from atonement. God's grace is not capricious. God's grace did not set aside justice. Justice had to be dealt with. Justice had to be administered. And so we see in the Passover sacrifice, some wonderful lessons concerning the atoning work of the Lord Jesus that is good for us to remember, not only on the first Sabbath of the year, but every day of life, every day of life. If we are a believer, this is what we owe. We owe everything. Yeah, we owe everything to the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus for us. And what better way to begin the first Sabbath of the new year than to have our thoughts drawn to the wonder and the glory of that sacrifice. But there's certain things we learn here. We learn that this lamb was an obvious substitute. The Lord said in verse 12, I'm going to pass through the land of Egypt this night. And I'm going to smite the firstborn of the land. I'm going to execute justice. I'm the Lord. But wherever the blood is, Wherever the blood is applied, in those places, I'll pass over. And if the animal, if the lamb was sacrificed, that sacrificed lamb will be the substitute for the firstborn. There was a sentence of death upon the firstborn throughout this entire land on that night. And it was only, it was only when the lamb became the substitute that there would be life. The sentence was clear. Normally, to be the firstborn was a position of honor. Normally, to be the firstborn of a family puts you in a place of special privilege. But not so that night. Not so that night. That night, the firstborn, right across the land, under the sentence of death. If anyone could ever understand the wonder and the beauty of God's gracious act of substitution, the firstborn could. Either the death of the firstborn or the death of the lamb, one or the other. And the firstborn would live only if the substitute died. What a lesson this is, the basis of our life. The basis of our spiritual life is outside of ourselves. It's outside of ourselves. It's because of that one that stood in our place. It's because of that one that came into the scene of time, taking upon himself our frailty and our nature and our ability to die. Because of that one that stood condemned in our place. In the place of every one of his people that there is life. We have life as believers because of the death of another. It's an essential truth of the gospel. And the Passover lamb says something to us of the obvious substitute. But it had to be a perfect substitute as well. The instructions were very clear. The instructions were very clear that you find that lamb, verse 5, without blemish. Without blemish. Any imperfection in this lamb would disqualify it from being the appropriate sacrifice. Any blemish in this lamb would disqualify it from being the substitute for the firstborn. It had to be a perfect, a pure, a blameless sacrifice. But a lamb itself. And here's the imperfection. Here's the imperfection even in the stated perfection that had to be there. How could a lamb be the sacrifice, the substitute for a man? 
had to be a man. This pointing, this is why it all points to the reality. It all points to the reality. This lamb can't be a substitute for me. This lamb can't be my, because it's not me, it's not a man. But it points to that one, the seed of the woman that was promised the very first revelation of the gospel. The seed of the woman was going to come, and that seed of the woman now would take upon himself our frailty, our human nature. But all oh, what it says to us, the picture here says volume concerning the Lord Jesus Christ, a lamb with those chosen. You choose the lamb. You go out and you look in the flock there and you choose the lamb, that one that was chosen. It points to the Lord Jesus. What a mystery this is in that eternal counsel and that eternal covenant between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, the Son. The son elect, Isaiah refers to Christ just as the elect of God. The elect of God, the eternal son was chosen in eternity to be the only mediator between God and men. To be the only redeemer of God's elect. The eternal son in that eternal council chosen, chosen the elect of God to be the redeemer, to be the mediator for his people. Christ was chosen. A lamb without blemish and certainly the perfection, the absolute perfection of the Lord Jesus. Peter, playing upon this, describes Christ as that lamb without spot, without blemish. That one that throughout his life, made of a woman he was, made under the law, The same law that you and I are made under Jesus was made under that law, the law that condemns us because of our transgression, because of our disobedience, because of our sin. The law that condemns us. The Lord Jesus made under that same law. We break it. He kept it. And all through his life, all through his life, maintaining that obedience, how perfect he was, the impeccable purity the impeccability, the sinlessness of the Lord Jesus. And a lamb that was tested, and this really falls within the same thought here. You ever notice that? The lamb was selected on the 10th day of the month. The lamb was slain on the 14th day of the month. Why the delay? Why the delay between the selecting of that lamb and the slaying of that lamb for the sacrifice? I would suggest to you that that was a time of testing, that that was a time of examination, a time of looking carefully at that lamb to make sure in every way that it was the lamb that had no blemish, that had no defect, that was indeed to be the perfect sacrifice. A time of examination. And so it was in the fullness of time And so it was in the fullness of time God sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law. But why is it? Why is it that the Lord Jesus coming into this scene of time, the mystery of the incarnation, just a babe, just a babe. And then for 30 odd years, for 30 odd years, He lives. For 30 odd years. Living under that law. The law that you and I live under. The law that condemns me. The law that condemns you. The Lord Jesus for those 30 odd years. Was living under that law. Subservient to that law. As his public ministry begins. Tested by Satan, proved to be pure and spotless and undefiled. In view of the world before God, the life of Christ, the life of Christ is as essential to the atonement as his death. For in his life, he kept the law of God. In his life, he earned that obedience. In that life, he earned a righteousness before God, satisfying every demand of the law perfectly unfailingly, every moment of his life. 
as a teenager. Can you imagine? Scripture does not reveal to us much of the youth of Christ. A little episode there in the temple, but beyond that we know nothing until his public ministry begins. But the evidence is clear. The evidence is clear that all through his life, growing up in his home, subject to his parents, keeping the law, never once as a teenager, can you imagine this, never once as a teenager, rolling his eyes at his parents. Perfect, pure, spotless in every way. And because he was the perfect sacrifice, Because he was the perfect lamb, impeccable, pure, and spotless, he earned, he earned, can I put it in those terms? It's a remarkable thought. But it was by his life, it was by his life that was so pure and spotless and undefiled and obedient to the law of God, it was by his life that he earned the right to die for his people. By his life, he earned the right to die for his people. Had he not been perfect, had he not been blameless, had he not been perfectly obedient to the law of God, then his death would have been his own. He could not have died for someone else. The death would have been his own. But he was. He was the perfect substitute. And the value of his death is linked to the value of his life. The perfect substitute, he was the slain substitute, this lamb. And the lamb gives to us a lesson both in the necessity of death and the necessity of the blood. For death was the execution of justice. There had to be death. The penalty of sin is death. Death was the earned end of sin. And as the vicarious perfection was imputed to the firstborn, So the sin of the firstborn was imputed to that lamb. He died. That lamb died. The penalty of sin. Death is the IOU that must be paid. Christ had to die. Christ had to die to fulfill the penalty for those that he represented. There were many in Egypt that night that paid their own debt. There were many in Egypt that night, the first born under the sentence of death that deserved to die, and they died. But they died because of their own sin. And those that lived that night of the first born lived by virtue of the death of the substitute. Justice had to be paid. Justice had to be paid, and that justice was in the execution of the Lamb. And so it is in the ultimate sense that our sins were imputed to Christ. Our guilt imputed to him. The chastisement to accomplish our peace was laid upon him. It was for our sins that he died. A death that was real. But it had to be the shedding of the blood as well. A clear demonstration that without the shedding of blood there is no remission. For it was not the corpse or the hide of that lamb that was put upon the doorpost. It was the blood. It was the blood. Death by itself. Understand what I'm saying here. The execution of justice doesn't care how death comes, just so there's death. The death was the requirement of justice. But without the shedding of blood, Without the violent shedding of the blood, there could be no remission. Without the shedding of the blood, there could be no atonement. So whereas the death of Christ satisfied, as it were, the justice of God, it is the shedding of the blood of Christ that satisfied now the wrath of God against our sin and made appeasement. The blood was shed. And with the shedding of that blood, the judgment then was diverted. And wherever the blood Wherever the blood was applied that night, there was success. And any gospel preacher loves to make this statement. The gospel works. The gospel works. There is power in the blood of Christ. There is irresistible power in the blood of Christ. 
And wherever that blood is applied, wherever that blood is applied, there is life. You read the narrative in Exodus. But the blood on the posts, the doors, life. No blood, death. There was success. There was success in this substitute. As the Lord said, when I see the blood, when I see the blood, I will pass over, I will leap over. There's going to be a protection, a guard over the Lord blocked the entry of the destroyer. The blood was the protective covering, the security. A wall of partition between God's people and the curse. Something to remember, that the gospel that we believe is not a vain gospel, not a foolish gospel, not a failing gospel. The gospel works. There is power in the blood. There is power in the blood in this Passover. And this is what God wanted these people and what God wants us to think about on this first Sabbath of the year. Here's God's message to us on this first Sabbath of this first month of the new year, you think and you remember that salvation is in Christ and Christ alone. Can I say thirdly, that on this first Sabbath of the first month of this year, we are to remember that salvation is through faith. It's faith. It is faith that puts its trust in the blood. There was plenty of blood that was shed that night in Egypt. How many gallons of blood, how many gallons of blood were shed that night in Egypt? But it was only with the blood applied that there was life. It is a historic fact that Jesus died. You can believe that. You can deny that. It's a historic fact that Jesus of Nazareth died on a Roman cross. It is a historic fact that Jesus died on a real day in history. Unbelief can't alter that. And it's not just that I believe it into existence. The fact of the death of Christ is not our salvation. The fact of the death of Christ itself is not what say. It's faith. Oh, it's the blood of Christ that saves us, that satisfies God. But it is through faith, through the exercise of faith, through the channel of faith, through the agency of faith, that we appropriate and we rest upon Christ as he is offered to us in the gospel. What is faith? Westminster, shorter catechism. Saving faith is that grace of God whereby we receive and rest upon Christ as he's offered in the gospel. We receive him. We rest upon him. Faith. And there is that objectivity of faith. And that's one of the things that really impresses me when I read this narrative of that first Passover, the objectivity of faith. Let me make a statement. The value of faith, the value of faith is determined by the object of faith. It is not faith alone in terms of just whatever this experience is that we call faith. We, we live in a day where we hear a lot of talk about faith, don't we? This faith group. And, and we see these cults and we see false religions that have faith, who live by faith. But how empty the faith is and how foolish the faith is because the object of the faith is not right. It is the object of faith. It is Christ that saves. And it is only as we receive Christ and rest upon Christ, we appropriate Christ through this gift of faith, this agency of faith, 
at their salvation. It's the blood that makes the difference. It's the blood that makes the difference. Oh, there is a subjectivity of faith as well. I want faith to be fervent. I want faith to be sincere. I want my faith to grow. But my faith is not as strong as it should be. And my faith is not as fervent as it should be. That's a wonderful thing in one sense. I want it to grow. Don't misunderstand me. But how much faith? How much, how much faith do you need? To be saved. I know exactly how much faith I need to move mountains. If I have faith the size of a grain of mustard seed, I can move mountains. I confess to you, I don't have that kind of faith. But the Bible never tells us, does it? The Bible never tells us how much faith you must have. It tells us what our faith must be. And this is why Peter why Peter, this is an amazing statement, isn't it? Peter talks about those of like precious faith. Like precious faith. Come on, this is Peter. This is the apostle. This is the Peter that walked upon water. This is the Peter that did such miraculous things in the ministry. And Peter says in writing to me that I have like precious faith with him. How can that be? How can that be? Not the subjectivity of it. But literally, it's faith that is equal in value. And what makes saving faith equal in value for every believer is the object of the faith. It's the object of the faith that determines the value of the faith. I'm the firstborn. I'm the firstborn of my family. I've often wondered what it would have been like to have been in Israel at that time, to be in Egypt at that time. To hear what Moses said. To hear what Moses said that there's going to be death tonight. Every firstborn is going to be under the sentence of death. Whoa. Unless, unless the lamb is sacrificed, unless the blood is sprinkled on the doorposts, there'll be death. And you hear that word, and you hear that word, and the night comes. And I'm sure that there were Israelite firstborn that went to bed that night having heard what Moses said that tossed and turned had a restless night wondering doubting having seen the blood put upon the doorpost but yet now can't see the blood he's inside the house tossing and turning very weak demonstration of faith. And then another heard the same word, heard the same word and saw the blood that was placed upon the doorpost and now he goes tonight to bed at night and he sleeps soundly. He sleeps peacefully, restfully, no doubts, no worries, no concerns. And what happened the next morning? They both awoke. The one that tossed and turned all night awoke to life. And the one that slept peacefully all night awoke to life. Because it wasn't, it wasn't the degree of their faith or the fervency of their faith, but what their faith was in. They were under the blood. They were under the blood. And that was the salvation. That was the deliverance. To be under the blood. And I love what the Lord says. The Lord doesn't say you'll be saved when you see the blood. It's when I see the blood. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the Lord sees what we cannot see. And as we come to Jesus and as we put our confidence and we receive him and we rest upon him as he's offered to us in the gospel. Old may doubt, may have weak faith. But the blood of Christ cannot fail. And the Lord says, when I see the blood, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. So we have a lesson here on what it is to trust. 
what faith is. But this faith is not a one-time operation, is it? Faith finds sustenance in the lamb. They were to eat it. The slain lamb became food for the new life. You eat the lamb. And the eating becomes a symbol here of peace, of fellowship, but also it speaks of the act of nourishment. You assimilate the lamb to yourself. You assimilate the lamb to yourself. Why like Christ says in John, unless you eat my flesh, unless you drink my blood, you have no part of me. We eat of Christ. We feast upon Christ. Oh, not literally in the sense of no, but symbolically to eat is to appropriate to ourselves. They, they, they say you are what you eat. I don't know if that's true or not, but certainly as we eat, as we eat, we take to ourselves all the nutriments of that which we are eating and becomes part and parcel of us. And so we feast upon Christ. And if there's anything that we are to remember and to learn on this first Sabbath of the new year, let us every day feast upon Christ. As he's revealed to us in the scripture, let us be in the word, let us be in meditation, let us feast upon Christ. And we can't feast too much. We can't eat too much of him. Let us feast upon him. Not a one-time meal, but the Lord is telling us here, eat, eat, eat of me, Christ says, eat of me, feast on me. There's where our strength comes. There's where our faith will grow and intensify. What a way to live the year. And the faith began the new life. We come back now to our text. This faith began a new life. This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. The Passover marked the birthday of that nation. It marked the beginning of the journey to the promised land. And so faith in Christ, saving faith in Christ, is not the beginning. Faith's a journey. It's a journey. We have a new life in Christ. There's new life in Christ. Old things passed away. All things become new. And what a wonderful thought, the beginning of this new year, as we anticipate what is to come and who knows what it will be. But one thing is sure. One thing is sure that if we're in Christ and Christ is in us, if we're under the blood and been saved by the blood of Christ, that the ultimate concern, everything is, everything is good. Everything is good. Again, I don't know what the year is going to bring forward. They didn't know what was going to happen. They got the wilderness. They were surprised in many ways. There'll be surprises this next year. There are going to be things happen this next year that you and I right now would never anticipate, never dream of. Happens every year. I don't know what's going to happen. But here's the one constant. Here's the one constant that God wants us to meditate on. Here's the one constant that God wants us to rejoice in and to be sure in that there is salvation in Christ. There's grace. There's power in his blood. And there's sustenance for life. We give ourselves to him. We give ourselves to him as he has given himself for us. So on this first Sabbath, let's remember, let us listen to God's New Year's message. Amen. Our gracious Lord, our gracious Lord, we stand amazed when we meditate upon the wonder of thy grace and the beauty of thy Christ, who is the only Redeemer, who is the only mediator between God and men. And we would pray, O oh Lord, that as we find ourselves now on the threshold of this new year, facing all of the uncertainties, have expectations. The Lord let us define, let us find this constant in all things as we face the days ahead. 
that there is a gospel that is sure, that is steadfast, that is the anchor for our souls. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our final hymn, number 475, Another Year is Dawn. Standing as we sing. Doxology will be 301, stanza 4. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Amen. Thank you for tuning in to this broadcast of Sovereign Grace United Reformed Church. Sovereign Grace Church, served by the ministry of Rev. Mitchell Dick, worships each Lord's Day at 9.30 a.m. and 5.30 p.m. at the chapel of Kuiper College, located at 3333 East Beltline Northeast, between Three Mile and Four Mile Roads. 
You are most cordially welcome to join us for worship or visit us online at www.sgurc.org or contact us by phone at 616-406-8562. It is our prayer that the Lord would add his indispensable blessing to this ministry in order that his name would be glorified through the edification of his people and the translation of sinners out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear Son.